Hi, this is Dr. V, and we're going to dive deep into this wonderful study in C major by Ferdinando Carulli. We will start with a discussion on form, and then we're going to go into each section of the piece, talking about left hand fingerings, right hand fingerings, chordal structures, balance, color, and all sorts of fun things. After that, we're going to talk about how to build your speed with a metronome. So, let's go. So let's talk about form. Form is the overall architecture of a piece of music. So in this case, we have six lines of music. There is a repeat sign at the end of the second line, after the fourth line, and the sixth line. And so it's very easy to identify separate sections. So if we take a look at the first two lines that are repeated, we'll call that the A section. And if we look at lines three and four, we'll call that the B section. And if we look at lines five and six, we'll call that the C section. Now the way this works is that you're going to play the A section twice, the B section twice, the C section twice, but then Look at the, the words underneath that sixth line. It says DC Alfine. DC means go to the beginning. So you're going to go to the beginning of the piece. Alfine means that you're going to go from that point until you see the word fine, which means finish. So in this case, when you do a DC Alfine, you do not take the repeat. So it's going to be AA, BB, C, C, A. All right, let's take a look at the A section. So the A section is actually pretty simple if you know your basic chord structures. Let's look at the first full measure. And look at the notes here. We've got a C, we've got an E, there's a G, there's a C, there's an E. Hey, wait a minute, what chord did I just make? A C chord. Pretty cool, huh? And if you look two measures later, we get the same thing. We have the same exact material. So the first and third measures. Here's the third measure. Oh, wait a minute. Here's the fifth measure. So if you learn that first measure, you've got three already. Uh, and then if we take a look at measure seven, it starts that way, but then it changes. So it starts with a C chord, and then we're going to get a different chord on the second and third beats there. But then look at measure eight. Look at the notes, C, E, G, C. Ah, guess what? C chord. So if you know your C chord, you can get through quite a bit of these first two lines, right? Now let's take a look at the second measure. What notes do we have here? We have a B and a G and a G here. Okay, but then that G has to move to an F. So these are actually two different chords, but they're very, very much related. This is a G. And this is a G7, except we're not playing all the notes. So the G is actually in first inversion. There's a B on the bottom. So it's a G with a B in the bass. And if you looked at pop music, you would see that written as a G with a slash and then uh, a B underneath. So G slash B means a G chord with a B in the bass. And that's exactly what this is. This is a G with the B in the bass. And then you get an F. The F is the seventh, so this goes from a G into a G7 chord. So this is second measure. And then you get to do the same thing again, measure six. And then something very similar in measure uh, seven, because it starts with the C that we looked at, but then we go to the G7, and then the G with the B in the bass. C chord. So if you know a C, a G, and a G7, you know the fundamental chord structure of this section. Now let's dig deeper. So the fingerings here I think are pretty good, but I do want to highlight a couple of things. Let's look at the second measure. It says to use the second and the fourth fingers. And that's really important. It makes it so much easier to change from this G with the B in the bass to the G7. If you were to use, let's say, one and three, which I think is a temptation for a lot of people, 
then your first finger would have to jump all the way from the fifth string to the first string. So that's a big jump. It's much easier if your hand can stay in one position. So from this to this. So I'll go from the first to the second measure. And you'll notice that my hand really doesn't move much at all. Where if I used that other fingering, if I did something like this, that's a lot more moving and I'm more likely to mess up and mess up my rhythm as well. So it's really important to take a look at fingerings like that. Another fingering I think is worth uh, bringing to your attention is the fourth measure, the last eighth note. So we have the scale. Very important to use your fourth finger because if you use your fourth finger, your third finger can prepare for the C here. If you do this with your third finger, then your third finger has to jump over to the fifth string. And so it gives us a little bit of a hiccup, right? If you use your fourth finger, you can connect directly into that next downbeat. So, again, fingering is, is so important to keep the fluidity of music going. So please pay attention to the fingerings that show up in any music that you get and try to understand what that fingering means. Uh, the finger number is just that, is a suggestion uh, by the editor. Uh, it is not a fret number, it is a finger number and it is not a tab. So I see people all the time, they see the four and they play the fourth fret no matter what. Remember, this is not tablature we're looking at, we're looking at musical notation. Um, but do take a look at those fingering numbers because they usually will make it easier to play. The next thing I wanna talk about is balance. So while this is just one piece of music, there are many layers here. Uh, one of the things that makes guitar so wonderful is that we can play polyphonically, meaning that we can play more than one note at the same time. Uh, you can't do that with a wind instrument, for example, or a brass instrument. And so we can actually keep a melody, a bass, and the filler inside, the harmony, uh, all at the same time. So let's just break it down a little bit. So in guitar music, if you look at the stems up, generally speaking, that will be the melody. And if you look at the stems down, generally speaking, that will be the bass. So where does the harmony lie? Well, the harmony is actually, uh, in this case, tied to the upper stems. And it's just to make it easier to read. That being said, it also makes it a little bit more difficult to understand exactly what the intent is. So if we were to look at just the stems up, you would get this. to sing that you probably wouldn't sing da di do 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 do almost sounds like uh you know a fire engine wow 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 that's not what the melody is if we were going to sing the melody it would actually be this da di da da di da da di da 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 and even though those are all written as eighth notes, most of them are actually quarter notes. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two. And actually that could be a, a half note or a dotted half note, depending on the way you hear it. Um, so what happens is to keep the music from looking so messy, a lot of times composers will put more than one voice on the same uh, beam in this case. So if the melody is all those notes on the beat, the one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, then what are those other notes? Well, if you look even closer, you'll notice that every other note is a G. It's every other note. So it's one and two and three and one and two. So those are what we call pedal tones. These are repeated notes where the melody moves around, right? And so what they do is they give us harmonic and rhythmic support. 
That's really the purpose in life for a pedal tone. Um, so when we put that together, you might not then play it this way. You might not go and give equal weight to everything because not everything is the melody, right? So you might balance it. You might want to have the melody louder and the pedal tone softer. Now enter the bass. The bass, in this case, are the stems down. Right? So if we put that together with the melody and the pedal tone, we get... Then we have a scale. The scale is just transition. It, it brings us back to uh, the second line in, in the same material. It takes us right back to this idea, right? So let's put it all together in that first two lines. Transition, back to the original idea. And then a little tag at the end that says, hey, this is the end of the phrase, right? So, that's what we're looking at when we're playing music. We want to think about what is the melody, what is the bass, and what is in between? What is that harmonic and rhythmic support that we're getting here? The next little bit that I want to talk about is color. Um, color is something that is subjective, meaning that Yes, you have the right notes in the right time, hopefully when you've learned this, but then we also want to make it interesting. There are many, many performers that say, you know, when there's a repeat, I try to play it differently the second time. And I think that's an important thing to do. What's the purpose of a repeat? So when somebody repeats something, it can mean, it could, you could take it different ways. So for example, you might go, wow, it's a really nice day today. You know, it really is beautiful outside. So I said the same basic thing twice, but the second time I had slightly different words and I said it slightly different with a little different inflection. Or let's try it the other way. So that was kind of loud then soft. Let me try it the other way. I could say, uh, Johnny, did, did you clean your room today? Johnny, I said, did you clean your room today? Right? So the second time, I said it louder. But it's really the same idea repeated. And we can do this with dynamics, which means the loudness and softness of something. Or we can also do it with color. And what is color? Well, on the guitar, we can have different sounds. So if I'm playing right behind the sound sound hole here, right here, uh, this is what we call normal. But I can get what we call a darker sound, uh, or the, the terms that we use are tosto, which means closer to the fingerboard, or also we can use the term dolce, which means sweet. So I'm going to play normal, then I'm going to play tosto, see what you think. We can also play another color called Ponticello. That means by the bridge, which is a brighter sound, right? So what I did in my performance at the beginning of this video was I played somewhat Tosto here. So, using color is a great way to make a difference in a repeat. I could have done it other ways too. I could have made it uh, loud and soft, or soft and loud, or maybe I would have changed color after the first four measures. Maybe I would have gone tosto. been 
fun, right? So there's more than one way to do these things, but I do want you to think about how you want to uh, impact your listener or what do you enjoy playing? You know, what kind of contrast would you like to create? So we have talked about left hand finger. We've talked about right hand finger. We've talked about balance. We've talked about color. Oh, wait a minute, right hand. I did not talk about right hand. Let's talk about right hand. Um, so in the right hand, we are using something that I call general right hand position. So that means that my A finger is on the first string, M finger on the second, third finger, uh, third string I have my I finger on, and then I'm using my thumb, which is called P, on the fourth, fifth, and sixth strings. And so this is going to be my reference here. Not to say I'll never change these fingerings, but this really, really works for about you know, 80% of what we do. And so if you look at my right hand, I'm going to use exactly those string assignments. Now I'm going to break the rule here. I'm going to use A, M, I, M, I, M. Now why would I use those? Well, first of all, when we're playing a scale, much more fluid if we're alternating our fingers, right? If you use the same finger, then it sounds a little choppy. And then we need to think about how we want to alternate. So in this case, I started with my A finger and then my M finger. The reason for that is that it's easier, it's easier to make a change from string to string or a string crossing from, let's say, a higher string to a lower string because this is the way that our hands are made. So if it's my second string going to the uh, third string, I had A, then M. If I did it the other way around, my fingers would be crossed, right? So here, my A finger uh, here on the D, my M finger on the G. And then I just want to alternate this point. So since my M finger just played the G, my I finger is ready to play, and then I have a really wonderful string crossing from the third to the second string. So my I finger on the third string going to my M finger on the second string. So again, it's just the way your hand is made. It's easier to make that connection. Otherwise, I'd have to twist my fingers, you know, the other way around. So this is a really great right hand fingering here. So I'd strongly encourage you to use this A, I, I so A, M, ready for the downbeat of the next line. So now we've talked about your left hand and your right hand balance and color. So we're moving on to section B. So the B section is very much like the A section in that it's built on chords. So if we were to take a look at um, the first measure of the B section, we have G, B, D, G, B, D. Well, this is just a G major triad or a G chord, right? And then if we were to take a look at the next measure, we have G, C, E, G, C, E. Well, if you look at it, it kind of looks like a C chord, right? If I got rid of my third finger, you'd see a C chord, right? Um, and then I put my third finger on the G. What well, is still a, a C chord? But the G is in the bass. So if you were to look at pop notation, you would call this a C slash G. So this is a C chord. So we had G and we have C. In the next measure, we just have a G7. And then just a regular old C chord. Right? Now, I will throw this out. Uh, in terms of the way we think of chords, you know, just playing these chords, right? If we look at the first measure of the B section, you have a G chord. The B to D, both of those are on the same string. They're both on the second string. So, so we're going to have to work on something to make that connection. So I'd recommend alternating from the B to the D. I wouldn't use the same finger twice. So you can go P, 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 I, M. If you were to look at the fourth measure of the B section, you have the C chord, and the E and the G are on the same string, so I'd alternate. So P, P, I, M, A, M. I would go A, M at that point, right? 
So we have our G chord, our C with the G in the bass, the G7, and our C chord. We get to do that again. We have the G chord, C with the G in the bass, and then this is very much um, like very similar to the last two measures of the A section. So if you were to look at the last two measures of the A section, compare that with the last two measures of the B section, you would see some, some real similarities. They both finish with the same exact C chord. And then if you were to look at the, um, either the first beat of the B section, you have the F and the D. Well, that is the second beat in the A section. And if you were to look at the D and the B together here, well, that would be the third beat in the A, from the A section. And then of course this, all on its own, right? Third beat is kind of on its own. And then we're here. But there are a lot of similarities in the last two measures of the A section and the last two measures of the B section. So how's the balance work in this? Where is the melody, the bass, and the accompaniment figures here? Well, in this case, these are just arpeggiated chords for the most part. That being said, I think that the bass is very important. And in this case, it's going to be the first note of the measure, uh, of the beginning of each measure. So you have the G. Right? So in this case, those the bass notes are very, very clear. Uh, and then we have the bass, the, the D, B, G, C. And we actually very, very clearly hear the melody in those last two measures. Da, 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 da. Now, you might want to interpret it so that you're hearing a melody, uh, maybe da, da. hear that but I kind of think that this is just a straight arpeggio just a chord that you're you're breaking the notes up uh, and then we do have melodic content for the last two measures so in terms of balance all of this can be um, pretty much evenly done and the range itself kind of balances itself higher notes tend to project more um, so you're actually going to hear those top two notes pretty well. Uh, the bass is also very, very important. It's the foundation of everything. Uh, but I really do hear this as just a series of arpeggios. Now, just like I talked about in the A section, you might consider playing loud, then soft, or soft, then loud, or maybe change a color. I think in my performance in all the sections, I play tasto, then ponticello. But you could have, uh, you could do the, your own uh, interpretation in here, you might want to go loud and soft or tosto ponticello or the other way around. So that is the B section. Let's move on to C. So the C section is very different from the A and the B sections. Um, while there are chordal implications here in the C section, it's not as straightforward as you have uh, in the A and the B sections. Really, the primary feature here are moving thirds. So what are thirds? Well, if we look at the first measure in the C section, we have an A and a C. And A, B, C, that's three notes apart, right? So that's what we call a third. And the third also looks like this. It's, it's two note heads that are stacked on top of each other. And in this case, da, da, di, da, di, da, da. they just move around with each other. So it's either going to be a space to a space or it's going to be a line to a line. And that makes a third. That's the way you can identify it when you're looking at your notation. And what makes this complex on some levels, at least rhythmically, is that when we look at these thirds, for example, the stem up is an eighth note. And the stem down is a quarter note, but yet they're playing together. And that kind of that can confuse people. But it's very much like I was talking about before in the A section when we had really not eighth notes, but 
don't really like quarter notes. Right? So in the C section, very much the same. We just want to look at the thirds, and we're going to let them ring through until they change, right? So it's going to be one, two, three. And so what happens, we really have a half quarter, half quarter uh, rhythm that continues through that entire section. Even though you're seeing eighth stems up and quarter stems down. So this is just something that as guitarists, we learn to interpret. We start to realize, oh, okay, that's what the implication is here. And it's even further supported when you recognize that we have pedal tones here. In this case, the pedal tones are not... Uh, in the middle of the texture, but above the texture. So in the A section, the pedal tone was in the middle. All those Gs. In this case, the pedal tone is uh, really up on top here. All those Es, right? That's your pedal tone. So, um, the pedal tone is not the most important part here. What's most important is the melody, right? So the melody is the top note of the thirds. And then the third is harmonized by a lower note. So listen. And then we also have a bass note. And the bass note comes in on beat two. Right? So we have, when we put this together. So we still have melody, we have bass, and we have harmony but they are kind of switched around a little bit in this section as opposed to what you had in the A section. Now, I want to talk a little bit more about those thirds when it comes to the right hand. It, is, it was really typical in the 19th century when we had these moving thirds, not to pluck them all like I and M, but to do what we call thumb sweeps. So in this case, I'm going to take my thumb and just strum. And I'm strumming these two strings. What's really kind of cool about that is that when I do one of these thumb sweeps, the last string that I uh, strike is the second string, right? And I can do really what's called a rest stroke with that second string into the first string. And that helps pop the melody out a little bit. And that makes this a lot easier to play, too. It really kind of lubricates this entire section. If I'm playing I and M, my M and A fingers, they really don't like to oppose each other. So if we did it with the general right hand position like this, boy, that really makes it tough. Just try moving. If you move your M finger, which is your middle finger, into your hand, you'll notice your A finger will move with it. These two fingers don't like to oppose each other. And so the whole idea of thumb sweeps Wow, that solves everything. We're just going to strum these thirds, and we're going to play the pedal tone with our M finger. Makes it so much easier. So that's the right hand of this section. Left hand, we're going to take advantage of guide fingers. So a guide finger is any finger that stays on the same string that moves to a different fret. So here, I start with one and two, but my second finger is going to guide to the G sharp and then go right back again. So if you look at your music, you see these little dashes. That's how a guide finger is notated. So it's not a minus two. All it is is the guide finger. So my second finger is guiding to the G sharp, then back to the A, and then one and two are both guide fingers to the B and D. And then we're back to the A and the C and then the G sharp and B. So we're just taking our fingers and sliding back and forth. And that is the prominent feature in this section. Also, just like I did in the A section and the B section, 
in this performance. I also played uh, Tasto, then Ponticello. Again, you can make your own choice about how you want to distinguish the repeat, whether if it's loud and soft or normal and top, uh, Ponticello or any of the colors that you might know. So that is it for the A section. Have fun with that. And then we're going to talk about the metronome. So that clicking sound, that mysterious clicking sound, that's my metronome. So this particular metronome app uh, is called Tempo, and I had to pay for it. I think it was a couple dollars, but there are a lot of free apps that are out there that are actually very, very good. Uh, there's also uh, just online, if you were to get on the internet, uh, there's, there are some free metronomes there that you could actually play uh, those metronomes through your laptop. Or you could go to a music store and buy a standalone metronome. Uh, that is totally fine. They all work fantastically. So really important to practice the metronome so that you have consistent tempo and uh, rhythm. And so I want to talk a little bit about uh, working with a metronome and how to develop your speed as well. I would never recommend that you come into a piece for the very first time uh, to try to play at tempo with a metronome. That's really hard. Most people at this level are not ready to play at tempo uh, their first time. Uh, and so we want to start at a slower tempo. My general rule of thumb is when you're learning music, let's just say you've worked on the first uh, four measures or something like that, um, and you're ready to play together, put it all together, maybe just work four measures at a time. Um, you want to choose a tempo that's the slowest possible tempo that you can play it perfectly. So, now I just did this at 120, but you might want to do this, I don't know, even just way slower. So I'm going to take this all the way down. Let's even start at um, maybe 40 beats per minute. Now that's the quarter note. And two, and three, and one and two and three and so it's pretty slow right but if you have to go even slower than that 30 or 20 even go ahead uh, now, sometimes it's hard to hear or understand the eighth note in between. So this uh, app will actually let me subdivide. So now we're hearing the eighth notes. And I'd recommend a, a metronome that does subdivide. It makes it a lot easier. So, and two, and three. That, that subdivides. Then, let's uh, the, the, the rule of thumb that I have is that you want to be able to play something perfectly three times in a row before you increase your speed. So let's just say I did that first one perfectly three times in a row, then I will allow myself to go up by 10 beats per minute. So I just did 40, I'm going to move up to 50. If I can get that to go, there we go. One and two and three and And again, let's just pretend I did it perfectly three times in a row, and then I'm going to go up to sixty. One and two and three. Let's 
let's go to 70. This actually turns into a really fun game after a while. Two. we start really hearing the character of the music. Sometimes we're going really slow. We don't really hear the melody so clearly uh, or just the overall rhythm. Three, one, two, three. So I'm at 80 right now. I'm going to go up to 90. Three, one. And then I'll go up to a hundred. One, two. support anymore and I'll just go back to a quarter note so it's a little easier to hear so I'm gonna move up to 120 one two three one two right and so 120 is about the tempo that I used when I did my original recording at the beginning of this video it might have been a little faster than that but it's right around 120 you don't have to make it to 120 uh, you can find a tempo that works well for you, but the main thing is you want to hear the character of the piece, you want to hear the melody, you want to make it sing-songy and all that sort of stuff. So uh, to make the music sound better and more fluid and rhythmic, I strongly encourage you to use a metronome. I hope you've enjoyed this video tutorial on this Karuli study in C major. I love the piece. It's a lot of fun. Happy practicing.